to kick things off on Friday Live, we usually like to go through what everyone's wearing on their wrist. So if you want to start off with what you're wearing. So uh, because we're offering the ultimate Daytona, in my humble opinion, I chose the watch that my wife most often wears. It's a Rolex Daytona reference 6263. This one is from 1986 with the big red Daytona logo. Um, it fits the wrist really well, and uh, actually I've sort of taken it back from my wife because I really like it. Um, so your wife a, wears that watch too? She wears it more, she used to wear it more than me, but I've kind of taken it back because that's it really cool. looks great on the wrist. But, uh, yeah. That's my choice for this week. It's yeah. awesome. And Ben, what are you wearing? Uh, I'm wearing a Universal Genève, a brand that I think many of you know I love. It's a triple calendar uh, with the day of the week up at 12 o'clock, moon phase uh, down at 6 o'clock. What's nice about this is it's got these beautiful claw lugs in, in a really nice shape. I've owned this watch for maybe five years. Uh, what's neat, and the reason why I bought it, is you see this reference every now and then. What's neat about this one is that it's actually not stainless steel, it's white gold. Wow. Uh, exactly. Cool. Uh, so white gold, you know, from the, the early 40s, late 30s, that it's was super not mint. Changed. That was not stainless. Um, I was surprised. Yeah, it, it's a weird thing. So when I found it, I was like, oh my god, I have to have this. I paid thankfully nothing for it. Uh, I don't wear it that much because it's white gold and it's quite small, things like that. But it's 14 karat white gold. Solid, uh, not plated. Uh, it's just a really beautiful watch that I don't wear enough, honestly. So thought I'd break it out today. Very, Very cool. cool. Yeah. Um, I'm wearing a, a borrowed watch from my dad. Thanks, Dad. Uh, his Patek Philippe 3919. Um, he let me borrow it a while ago. I can't say I'm going to oh. give it back. Um, <laughs> it's the Calatrava. It's 34 millimeters, which I remember as a kid it being so big, but it's actually not as big as I remember it being. What kind of strap? Now, yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, so color. I have it on a Hodinkee strap, the short strap in burgundy suede, perfect for fall. Um, so <laughs> that's what I'm wearing. So anyways, without much further ado, I think we should really just hit the ground running and start talking about these highlights that you brought because they're awesome. So. Absolutely, with, with pleasure. So um, of course, when you have the one of the most legendary, one of the most important watches of the 20th century, um, a legendary, the legendary Paul Newman's own Paul Newman Daytona, we designed an iconic auction, a thematic auction around it with other important iconic watches of the 20th century that from 30 feet away you'd recognize the watches, what they are. So the first highlight I'm happy to share is the oldest and earliest Submariner. It's a reference 6200 made in 1954, which is the year Rolex launched the Submariner. In that year, they launched three different models, the 6204, the 6205, which were water resistant to 100 meters with a small crown, and they made one for professional divers, water resistant to 200 meters with a big crown. This is so early that the dial was made before Rolex ever settled upon the name Submariner. So the dial does not even have the name Submariner. The 6200, the 6200, and the 6205 were the very first Rolex sport watches ever to incorporate a Mercedes hand. Sure. So this one has a, a bit longer Mercedes hand that gives it such character. The watch is, for me, the finest 6200 that's ever appeared on the market. I've hunted the watch since 2004. Uh, with the Paul Newman coming to auction, the collector, a distinguished collector, uh, finally agreed to let it go for yeah. us in the sale. The case was never polished, the bezel is original, the dial is absolutely stunning. Uh, so proud to have that. And so this, I mean, for, for a sub guy like myself, uh, you know, I've seen a bunch of 5510s, 6538s, stuff like that. This is a step further, yes. a considerable step further. It, it, it is the earliest, and the reference 6200, I mean, great, great point, uh, Ben. With the 369 on the dial, the collecting community has called it the King Submariner because they're so hard to find. They made so few because, you know, it was the first year of production. Um, the 369 layout didn't really stick on the Submariner. Um, compared to the 6538, which was later in the 5510, it's significantly harder to find. So we're absolutely thrilled to have this example in sale. And what's the estimate on this guy? 250,000 to 500,000. Pretty cool. Yep. How few are we talking? Uh, like probably two, three? Two to 300. Okay. Maybe. So, so, yeah. Maybe. yeah. And at this point, you know, we, we've seen a bunch being in, in the watch world, and I, I can say I've never seen one quite like that. Thank you, sure. man. Yes, I appreciate that. Cool. What else do we have? So with that, on the theme of sport watches, we have a special Omega Speedmaster that's much more than meets the eye. I think the uh, Speedmaster community is very familiar with the Speedy Tuesday special sure. uh, model made by one of your close friends, Robert Yan. Mm -hmm. So the inspiration to that ha is this particular watch. It's um, 
a Project Alaska 3, and I like to call it the American Speedmaster. Omega wasn't so happy when I tried to call it the American Speedmaster, which I, I can understand. Um, but it's call, I call it that because it features a case made in the USA. This was made for NASA. Uh, it has a special dial based on feedback from a NASA astronaut that uh, the subdials have radially oriented numerals, and they're much larger than the civilian versions of the uh, Speedmaster. The case, because in the mid-1970s, the U.S. Congress passed an act, the Buy American Act, any government agency that wanted to procure a product had to buy American. So Omega really, of course, wanted to continue to be the supplier to NASA, so they found a creative way to comply. They found the Star Case Manufacturing Company, based in Michigan, contracted with them, Star Case Manufacturing Company, you see a star on its case back, right there. The case is made in the USA. It has a bead blasted um, case, no, no polished surfaces, based on feedback from NASA, mm -hmm. polished surfaces uh, reflect too much sunlight. Um, the dial is it's the only Speedmaster with no Swiss or Swiss made designation on the dial at 6 o'clock. So Omega made 56 and delivered 56 to NASA. All 56 of those models are illegal to own. They're property of the U.S. government. They made a second batch. We don't know exactly how many, but we think it's very few that are legal to own. The Omega Museum was very kind and helpful to us, so everything I've just shared with you all comes directly from the Omega Museum at the request of this watch. It's a, a fabulous example, has such a great story to tell, and for this market, for our first New York auction, to have what I call, again, the American Speedmaster, I'm thrilled to have it. I think we can make American Speedmaster happen. <laughs> I yeah. think that's a new hashtag that needs to go on your Instagram. Kara, I agree. <laughs> and, and this is really, I mean, if you look at the Speedy Tuesday, uh, which I'm actually getting today by pure coincidence, mine finally arrived. Funny. Thank you guys. Took, <laughs> took long enough. Um, this, I mean, it looks just like this. This is really the inspiration of, of that watch. It, because I think it's got a beat blasted case. The, it has contrasting sub dials, yeah. but it has radially oriented numerals right. just, like, just like this. Yep. So it's the first one that's ever appeared on the, the market. Um, it's just a special opportunity. That's neat. It's really exciting. So still on the theme of sport watches, um, I should mention that the sale has just 50 watches. We carefully curated uh, this selection and uh, we have six, six on view here. So one of the more affordable um, watches we have is the Hoyer Monaco. Uh, a very popular example made famous by Steve McQueen, of course, in the movie Le Mans with the blue dial with white contrasting subdials, The case is new old stock. It even has the original case back sticker. Mm -hmm. It comes with the original hang tag, the guarantee, the inner and outer boxes with the 1133B uh, caliber, um, uh, reference number. The case is unworn. Uh, we're thrilled to have it. The estimate begins at 10,000. There's no reserve. It's the first lot of the sale. Uh, we think um, it's just a great value watch for uh, building a collection to start. Sure. It's a good way to kick off a sale. When, yeah, off, yeah, obviously. <laughs> when you were going to pick the watches for the 50 lots, like, did you have in your mind what you wanted to, fill, to build the sale? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we embarked on this journey, of course, you know, we figured out, what's the, we tried to figure what's the best way to sell this watch. And with a lot of deliberation between the international team, or El Box, um, we, we created this theme, this winning icons with iconic watches. So you ask Ben Clymer, you ask Jack Force, you ask Cara, what's your list of the iconic watches of the 20th century? You'll create a list. So the international team, all of us, created our own lists of what we feel are those iconic watches that your mom, your, your, your friends, you know, would say, that's an iconic watch for sure. I know a Speedmaster, I know a Cartier. My tank. mom would not say that. My mom has no idea about watches yet. <laughs> I thought your mom might. <laughs> <laughs> Two tone day dress, that's it. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we put together this list of, of watches we hoped to get. Yeah. So of course the list ran, you know, maybe 100 watches long altogether. The challenge was finding those examples that meet Philips' quality criteria. Right. We're very selective. We reject 70 to 80% of the watches that come our way. Uh, because we focus on quality. So of course we wanted a great vintage Reverso, absolutely an iconic watch. We just could not find one in the condition and quality we wanted. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this what you see is the result of really a targeted selection, reaching out across the community and hunting for the very best examples of what we feel are iconic watches. So that includes like A-Series Royal Oak, for example, uh, Tanks and Trey in Platinum, which yes. is unbelievable. Oh, uh, the Patek Philippe Nautilus. Nautilus, of course. The Vacheron 222. Yep. 
we have the very first gem set Rolex uh, G, uh, sport watch, the GMT Master Saru. Mm -hmm. For people who are really into uh, high-end Rolexes, that's a that's an important <laughs> watch. Yeah. Um, Guilty. Yeah, so we're, we're thrilled. We're thrilled with the selection. And if you come to New York, you'll see all 50 watches on view uh, until the auction. Amazing. Cool. And next up, we have the Chocolatone. Is that how you say it? Yes, I think, <laughs> I, think I'm not, I don't speak Italian, but <laughs> it sounds pretty good to me. Um, so I, uh, collectors who know me, uh, I have a soft spot for Vacheron Constantin. And f for me, w w one of the ultimate watches to own is a Chicolatoni. And this one here is the world's finest. It's pink gold. It was Vacheron's most complicated wristwatch. At the same time, it was its largest wristwatch. And at the same time, it, it, it's cased in its most prestigious metal made in 1958. It has these amazing curves and contours that make it a, a work of art. Mm. Um, only three are known to have appeared. And in this pink. is in pink, yeah. in pink gold. Um, this is the finest and best preserved example. It has never been polished. The dial has never been restored. To find it, um, I was absolutely thrilled and I couldn't wait to get it. And I was really praying that the consigner would sign that consignment agreement. And when he finally did, I did a dance around the office. What does that look like um, exactly? Yeah. No, you don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too early. It's too early. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe after, after the sale. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is a, a, quite a special piece that we're really, really proud to have. So I'll put that here. And it's named chocolate donating because it's shaped like a piece of chocolate. Like a piece of chocolate, like a box of chocolates you buy. Yeah. The Italian community um, give it a really fitting name, a chocolatoni. I, I, I don't know if I can Or chocolate, we don't know. Yeah. None of us are Italian, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so uh, now we go to one of the youngest offerings. So, of course, the sale includes only 20th century watches. <gasps> and we're thrilled to have the most, in my view, the most important wristwatch of the late 20th century, Philippe Dufour's Duality. Right. It's the world's first wristwatch to incorporate two movements with two escapements. And they work together through a differential gear to improve the overall accuracy. It predates Jorn's Resonance, which is also another watch with two movements and two balance wheels, by three years. Um, the Resonance provides the time to two independent dials and two independent seconds hands. This is one time uh, indication and one seconds hand indication. This one is number zero, zero. We believe it's the very first one. It comes complete with its box and papers. It's the only one ever that was offered publicly. It sold in 2007 to the collector who's consigning it today. So the collector owned it and enjoyed it for 10 years. And the watch is in amazing shape. It's a wolf in sheep's clothes. It looks very humble and simple um, you know, from the front, but in the back, it's a monster. Yeah. And, and this one, people have to be going crazy for, I would imagine. So uh, in our world tour, the number one most requested watch to be seen, of course, was Paul Newman's Paul Newman Daytona. Sure. Uh, number two, vying for number three, close, close to, uh, they're very close to, um, to most requested is the duality. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an important watch. And, uh, and, and so incredibly rare. So I mean, the, the kind of common thinking is that there are nine, there might be a few more maybe, but there's no more than... than no, no, no more than 10, we believe. But, right. but from communication from Philippe Dufour, the last word we got was he made nine. Yeah. Um, Philippe Dufour's importance is, is quite known, I think, to the Houdinki community. Yeah. He was the first uh, Swiss watchmaker ever to create a grande petit sonnerie in a wristwatch. Right. And he followed that up with the first wristwatch ever to include two movements and two escapements. And his finishing is, is surreal. To, um, if you ever have the opportunity, take a loop, look at these movements, look at the quality of the hands, the quality of the dials. It's, you can't get any better than this. Okay. And if, if simplicity is now, of which there are at least 200, are selling in the 200s uh, regularly, you have to wonder what a duality, of which there are 9 or 10. So we offered it conservatively at 200,000 to 400,000 US dollars based on you know, what we see the sim simplicity is going for. It is 34 millimeters, so it's a little bit smaller than what some people like. So we think our estimate is, is uh, in line, but um, we shall see uh, how the collecting community uh, feels about it. Yeah. Do you want to flip it over so they can see what Oh, good do? call. I wish I had a polishing cloth. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ben. Oh, Ben has a polishing cloth. Wow. So prepared. Yeah, the duality is, uh, you know, it's, it's about as good as it gets for a, a modern watch, I would say. Um, it's really totally good. agree. And this is platinum. Platinum. Yeah. 
All right, should we drum roll? Give us a drum roll. So what do we have here, Paul? This so old if thing. I may reach. <laughs> that needs a pause. Uh, every time I hold it, goosebumps. Um, <laughs> for me personally, this is the most important watch of the 20th, most important wristwatch of the 20th century. I started with watches at age 10 in 1986. Yeah. And there was no internet back then, so you had to find information the old fashioned way, by magazines, by books. And in those few early years, wristwatch watch collecting was only beginning to grow. And I remember, you know, in, in the search for information, I would look in these classified ads trying to find watches for sale. And emblazoned in my memory, it's the late 80s, wanted Rolex Daytonas with Paul Newman dial. Top price is paid. Turn the page. Wanted, top dollars, top dollar paid, Paul Newman Daytona. Way back then. So who, so who was placing those ads? D dealers that we know today. <laughs> the, the same guys. <laughs> the same guys. Yeah. Many of them. Yeah. And of course, this is I'm 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Um, it's in my formative years as a collector. And the fact that it's come to us when, when Orel Bax got the call, he didn't believe it. When the person who recommended that James Cox contact Orel got the call that Paul Newman's Paul Newman is around. He didn't believe it. Yeah. Um, the fact that we have it, and we, we received it back in April or May 2016. Yeah. It was in Phillips's possession since then when Orel picked it up from James Cox, the wow. consigner. We spent a lot of time working on how best to offer this, this watch, and um, it, it deserves it. It's mm -hmm. such an important watch to wristwatch collecting, I mean, before Paul Newman's name was associated with the Daytona, the Daytona was Rolex's worst selling model. Yeah. They would sit in the uh, showcases for years unsold. Then comes rumors that Rolex is going to discontinue the manually wound Daytona. Then comes rumors Rolex is going to introduce an all new automatic winding Daytona. This is 1988. You have the name, the iconic name Paul Newman associated with those with exotic dials. Yeah. It was a perfect storm demand for the Daytona skyrocketed around that time. Not only did it help fuel the popularity of the Daytona, as today many of you know, the most sought after modern watch, luxury watch you can buy is probably the Daytona. Mm -hmm. The most sought after vintage collectible watch is a Paul Newman Daytona. It's all thanks to this watch right here. That actual watch. The only one that Paul Newman owned and wore <coughs> that was fitted with an exotic dial. Yeah given to him by his loving wife, Joanne Woodward, in 1968 or 1969, when the two of them together were filming the movie Winning as co-stars. He falls in love with motorsport. He's about 45 or 46 at the time. And his wife is very smart. She bought him a fitting gift, the watch designed for motorsport, yeah. named after the Daytona International Speedway in Florida. And uh, we believe she bought it from Tiffany and Company based on the recollection of Nell Newman, Paul Newman's daughter and she engraved it with this wonderful saying, um, drive carefully to me. And I hope you guys can see it. Yeah, the inscription really kind of makes the watch. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you can imagine on the world tour, we were very careful of anyone taking off that case back. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, security was watching. So, uh, so this is it. Say. I mean, this is yeah. the end this game. Is it. Right? This is the ultimate Here Daytona, one of the ultimate wristwatches on the planet, in my humble opinion. So we'd also like to make the announcement that this is actually the last week of Hodinkee because we're done at this point, right? We've, we've got <laughs> we this last Friday say. live. Yeah, after next Thursday, we shut down. Yeah, it's funny. Um, so, I mean, th this is obviously a, a, such a meaningful watch for, for, for all of us. I mean, the Paul Newman, the Paul Newman, Paul Newman is the archetype for, for collectible watches, kind of period, I would say. Uh, so what was it like when you were informed that this watch was going to yeah. be consigned with, uh, with Phillips? So when, when Orel called me that, that summer of, or late spring of 2016, Paul, what if I told you <laughs> <laughs> we got it? What did you get? We got it. Tell me. Yeah. Paul Newman's Paul Newman Daytona. What? <laughs> I was absolutely shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't believe it. I, I was awestruck. Did you do the dance around the office? Uh, I was just too shocked. I couldn't move. <laughs> frozen. <laughs> You're just frozen. It was like a deer in the Yeah. And, and what's amazing about it is that it's relatively kind of unmolested, right? It's got the original dial, which we didn't really know. If that you know, maybe you find yeah. the watch that's got a replacement dial, or replacement hands. This is this is the original dial, original hands. The original dial, original hands. Never polished, believe right. it or not. It worn, was worn certainly. and enjoyed. Definitely has as visible signs of wear. 
but uh, everyone who's inspected it and seen it is very pleasantly surprised at how well preserved it actually is and they are just thrilled with the fact that it's never been polished so that's why yeah. the engraving is so crisp it's a very you know shallow engraving and, yeah. and had it been polished once or twice it definitely wouldn't have this um, clear visibility that it's got it's even uh, engraved on this log here with what we believe the Tiffany and Company yeah. inventory mm -hmm. number um, which which collaborates with the uh, account from Nell Newman. Sure. So if, if you if you buy this watch, do you get the two large men to come with that are standing over oh, here to yes. come with it? Do you get the two security guards? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it is another wolf in sheep's clothes. Yeah. Right. You don't know what it is yeah. on the wrist until you turn it on the case, turn it around, and yeah. uh, another monster lies behind. Yeah. It. So, who, so if I can ask, who's the buyer for this? Yeah. Is it an American guy? Is it a Hollywood guy? Asian collector? European collector? You know, we we just don't know. Yeah. We. Um, we think it transcends watch collecting. We think it's a piece of a cultural, culturally, historically significant art. Yeah. And um, it could be a museum, it could be an art collector, it could be a car collector, it could very well be a watch collector, somebody nostalgic and, and has memories like I do yeah. of the yeah. growth of the popularity of the Daytona. So we, we are very eager and excited to see uh, who ends up being the winning bidder. And, um, October 26th in New York, uh, we'll see. Yeah, you so stressed? Cool. Feeling good? Yeah. I'm excited as heck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired a little bit because yeah. we were uh, all around the world for four weeks. We yeah. visited uh, Tokyo, Taipei, Hong Kong, London, uh, Seattle, Los Angeles. Some of my team went to Miami. Uh, we went to Greenwich, Connecticut, and now finally we're here in New York. So uh, it's uh, hard work, but worth every bit of effort You know, this watch deserves. How hard was it to not tell anyone about this? <laughs> like, did you tell your wife? Like, were you just kind of like sworn to secrecy? Like, did you, have to, secrecy did you have to sign an NDA? I mean, as Ben knows, I used to be paid to keep secrets in my former career. This is true. Um, and uh, it's far more important than secrets, to be clear. <laughs> Even more important than the Paul Newman. Yeah. What? Um, it's amazing how well the secret was kept. Yeah. So when the news broke, it really that's surprised shocking. people, and that's exactly what we were hoping to happen. That was a cool day. It was a cool day. It was cool. I feel kind of like nauseous being around the Paul Newman. <laughs> I don't know why. Like it just makes me feel really like very. Like I'm not worthy. You wanna, you wanna touch like, it? Uh, well, I already. Well, I, I took a wrist shot earlier. It's so cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, we we were chatting earlier uh, before we we went on the air. It would be hard for me to even conceive a kind of sexier, more important wristwatch today. Like if somebody said yeah. you can draw it, you can make up the backstory. Uh, I don't know that I could come up with something better than, than Paul Newman's Paul Newman in, in this kind of like authentically worn condition with direct lineage, you know, direct provenance. Uh, it's, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. What, what, what's, what's also awesome is the charitable aspect of it. Right. Yeah. So, so James Cox is the consigner. He was the boyfriend of Nell Newman right. uh, during their college years. And um, he received it in 1984. Today, this is why it's coming for sale. Nell Newman started her own charitable organization in 2010, the Nell Newman Foundation, and really felt it's time to sell it and help get Nell's foundation off the ground. So a significant portion is going to support it. And it, what a wonderful way to give back. Are, are you yeah. able to say what percentage is going it's to? Still, it's still being determined. Um, it hasn't been um, finalized. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Are you going to get it? Am I going to get it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm going to try. Uh, something tells me I'm not going to get it, but I'll try. If you, should we do like a GoFundMe account and like yes. we all buy it? I'll be, I'll be like the guy that, that keeps it in my apartment or whatever. Uh, and then You'll like be we can wears it. Yeah, well, I'll be the guy that wears it. Uh, you guys pay for it. Uh, no, should we do a GoFundMe? Yeah, sure. I we'll, like I'll we set can, it up after the I mean, we can definitely show. get a few million dollars raised by, by next Thursday. We're accepting bids from all verified parties. So, so okay. I'll bid $10 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully it won't work. Yeah, no, th this is really, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a borderline emotional thing for, for, for us to see this watch, yeah. I would say. I mean, this is, this is it. There's you nothing know. greater. There's nothing greater. Uh, you know, we have a great photo uh, on the wall over here um, of, of Paul, you know, at, uh, at Sebring, actually. You know, when he's got his hand on his ear and he's wearing this actual watch, which I think Carr posted to Instagram, so we have the actual watch. It's on watch. a few stories yeah. now circulating. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild to see this kind of in the flesh. Yeah, it's amazing. Totally agree. Thank you so much for bringing it in. Honestly, it's, 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 it's like our it's our pleasure, and uh, we appreciate Hodinkee for having us. For cool. sure.
Well, we're still not done because we have a couple of questions that people submitted yesterday. And don't forget to submit your questions at the end of the episode because we will get to those as well. So yesterday we wanted people to submit questions for you personally. So the first one is from Owl's Bench. Mm. Paul, I share your affinity for vintage Vacheron Constantin. My personal favorite was the Steel 4178 in Geneva II. Just my personal <laughs> favorite of mine, too. <laughs> Geneva II or Geneva I? That was Geneva Watch Auction 1, oh, okay. the Steel, which broke a record for the highest price ever achieved for a Vacheron chronograph. Yeah. There you go. I bid on that watch. You're smart, smart to bid on. I came nowhere near even winning. <laughs> Um, despite the beauty and amazing craftsmanship that these watches possess, their price, price is lagging in comparison to the likes of Patek Philippe. To what, what, do you add, what do you attribute this to? Is this just a good time to buy as they represent a relative value? What references do you most appreciate from Vacheron? Great question. Um, Many I layers. think Vacheron Constantin offers tremendous value, especially vintage Vacheron. One of the reasons I think that they, they trade for a bit less than comparable Patek Philippe's is because there's far fewer. Right. So when you have far fewer out there, you have less of a market for them. Um, I, I love to share the story that you, you guys know that until the 1960s, Vacheron had a policy never to make 24 examples of a particular model. Right. So finding two identical Vacherons is like finding a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. So when you buy a vintage Vacheron, the chances are very high that you'll never see another like it again. So they're absolutely fun to, connect, to collect. They're extraordinarily high quality, uh, equal to Patek in terms of finishing quality and, and uh, case construction. Design is totally original. Um, I'm a huge fan of theirs. So they are great value, and um, it's just a number of factors why Patek Philippe, um, they're, they're a bit more sought after. It's just there's, there's more of the Pateks and, and less of the Vacherons. Mm -hmm. So how does that compare to like AP? Similar, similar story. Um, you know, w w one, in one sense, it's also the participation of the brand in their own heritage. Okay. Um, Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, they buy back their old watches. They, they believe in their future so much that they buy back their past yeah. be because they, they know how great their heritage pieces are. Mm -hmm. Less so we, we've seen, but uh, with other brands, um, Vacheron Constantin does have a museum, uh, which, which is great. And um, I think that that kind of potential for, for Vacheron to rebuy its heritage pieces, that would really greatly help um, the community and uh, values, but we, we, we don't know what they, what they might do. Yeah. Um, next question is from Prov 1227. With Rolex moving towards ceramic bezel based watches, including the Daytona now, do you expect any of the current Rolex watches, Daytona sub GMT, to, event, to be eventual classics or sought after in the vintage auction market, say in 30 to 40 years from now? Yeah, I think what was a classic, I think will remain a classic right. in, in, many, in many cases. Ben, I saw that. <laughs> what did you do? We got security back there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're timeless designs, and 30 to 40 years from now, they're going to look as good as they do today, I'm certain, just like how good that Daytona looks from 1968 today. Um, for collectors, I suggest you look for very early um, examples of a new iteration. So when the Daytona came out with a ceramic bezel, focus on the very first one or two years of that model because there's sometimes I got, I got one of those. subtle <laughs> differences subtle differences that happen as they evolve. It's, it's always with Rolex. Anytime they introduce a new model, they iterate. Right. And they don't make the announcement. Like Nobody knows. Nobody it's knows. up to the collector set to identify that. And those early iterations, especially in the vintage watches, are what people really clamor for because they're basically prototypes. Rolex mm -hmm. hated to waste uh, anything that they made, so they sold their prototypes. With the modern watches, it's less so that way because these are really um, commercialized pieces and everything's really vetted before it gets released. But within a year or two, we do sometimes see a subtle difference, whether it's a, a change in a hairspring, whether it's a change in a seconds hand, some subtle improvement that makes it a little bit different. And those earliest iterations of, an, of a new generation model like a GMT, I say those, those have potential to be sought after in the future. Cool. Very cool. Um, all right, well, let's go to our live questions. Okay. Oh, we have a lot. Oh, there's a lot. Oh, okay. I like this one. <laughs> ben needs to buy it. I agree. I completely agree. Uh, I unfortunately cannot, I'm afraid. I'll try. But yeah. <laughs> 
Um, from Son of Alanga, if you could own one of the watches being offered at the coming Phillips auction, which one would it be and why? For me, this question. We can all answer. Well, well, answer yeah, you go yeah. first, though. Okay. It's Paul Newman's Paul Newman. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, next to that, I would say, gosh, it's a tough one. Yeah. I have many favorites. It's like picking a favorite child. It's hard to do. Um, mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Got a soft spot for this. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Cara? Um, mine is the octopusy, which is... <laughs> really don't like that <laughs> word, <laughs> but it's the Rolex with the sapphires and the diamond set, uh, the ladies piece, and I really like that one. I just think it's really loud. That was loud the, the most luxurious version of Rolex's yeah, most prestigious mint, model. Isn't it? Mint condition. Yeah, I can't wait to see it Cylindrically tonight. set round diamonds that look like the suction cups of an octopus. Hence, Hence the, the name. name. Octopus. Yes. Also a James Bond reference, I'm assuming. Um, yes. Yes, okay. That's mine. Yeah, uh, and I would choose, I mean, obviously, obviously this, uh, but after that, the, the Platinum Centre from Cartier is yeah, yeah, incredible. Amazing. incredible. Uh, and then the, the white gold 3448, you know, really I mean, nice you watch. can't, it's, it's just a watch that you can wear every day, it's white metal. This one's box papers, I think? This yeah. one is, has box, um, it's got a very rare dial okay. um, with a radially flipped date chapter yeah. at 6 o'clock. So self-winding, white metal, perpetual, you know, really heyday of, of Patek, that would be up Fabulous there. Fabulous watch. Um, A-series Royal Oak, I've owned, I've got a soft spot for those, obviously, I think that's a nice one. Uh, what else? You got? The, the Zenith A386, which is another, I've, I've owned that as With well, those are great. Papers, really cool great watch. Great watch. Uh, for the money. Um, there's a lot the of Cartier stuff. crash, I have to say. It's like a Cartier London yeah, crash amazing. watch with the original large dimensions. Yeah. It's absolutely fabulous. Can I change my answer? That's what I want. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> the, 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 the case dial completely handmade. Wow. It's That's amazing. Sick. Sweet. Exciting. What else? Um, okay, so this actually I think I've heard from a lot of people around on like social media and stuff. Um, they, pe I'd love to know why they chose to put the watch on this strap. Can you mm. tell us the oh. story behind the strap? Yeah, absolutely. So. We tried our very best to recreate the strap that Paul Newman wore the watch on. Yeah. So he took it, immediately he took it off the bracelet and put it on a, a bun strap, a bun crocodile strap. Um, so we, we found a strap maker who custom designed this strap for it. And we just wanted to keep it as close to uh, the spirit of Paul Newman as possible. Um, we felt if we put it on a bracelet, it just doesn't yeah. you know, you know, represent what it was and how it was worn. So uh, yeah, that's the story behind it. It's how, yeah. exactly how Paul Newman wore it on this bun strap. It was so cool, yeah. and uh, we, we tried to recreate that. The, the original strap is long gone. Yeah. Straps are like tires on a car. They're disposable, they wear, and um, had it been present, it would have been great, but um, the value is not in the strap. The value is in the head of the watch. Yeah. Yeah. I think what, what's so funny, like the most amazing like internet-y moment in my most recent memory is we posted a photo of this actual watch on that strap, and on Instagram, and people were just going crazy, railing yeah. against this ugly strap, blah, blah, blah. And then some guy chimed in saying, like, that's what Paul wore it on, and then everyone just went <laughs> silent. I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, it's what he did. And yeah. uh, so yeah. we tried to stay true to the original. And a lead up to that is from the Mr. Verdez, or Mr. Mercy, Mr. Verdez. Would, would it be sacrilegious to change the Paul Newman strap? N no. I mean, whoever ends up buying it should Can wear it the way, the way want he wants. I it, mean, yeah. In one sense, it's nice to not have it on the bun strap because you have quick access to the case back where you can right. see the engraving. But this strap does permit you to From easily where? take it out to see it. Yeah. So, I mean, I would personally advise the client who wins, keep it on the strap, yeah. but uh, do whatever you wish. It's, it's uh, yeah. freedom. Um, from Stephen, I can't speak tough today. Tough last name. It, that's tough. From yeah. Stephen, what other famous watch would you love to go see up for public auction? Oof. That's hard. Yeah. Um, there aren't so many we we this it, one. we honestly hope that the sale of this watch opens more people's eyes to the greatness of collecting wristwatches. Yeah. That's really one one hope for us. Another hope is it gets other important watches out of the woodwork. Um, for public auction, you had a gentleman, Jack Nicholas. Uh, that you recently interviewed, we would love to offer his his watch if he, if he decides to to sell it in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, a fantastic day date with a wonderful history, worn, yeah. worn daily and enjoyed. Um, the twenty four ninety nine owned by 
um, John, John Lennon, Lennon yeah. Yeah. is one that we would love to uh, see come come to auction at Phillips. Um, yeah, there, there's a few out there, yeah. and we're we're always hunting. And um, but even still, none of those really like none of those not. have the, the story of, yeah. of this, right? Th this is you know all of those watches have a unique kind yeah. of provenance. This one is a, it's it's history, it's story, it's it's really unprecedented. Uh, yeah. For for a watch that has ever appeared at auction, yeah. I feel like this watch in particular though has like it's such a more, it's a bigger impact on the collecting industry as a whole rather than watch. just yeah the, rather than just being owned by Paul Newman. It's yeah. like it changed collecting and how yeah. people view vintage watches. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the only thing that could potentially rival it and it will never happen because of, of legal issues is is an Apollo Eleven. Yeah. Right, which will never B happen. Buzz Aldrin's Speedmaster, for right. example, which is illegal tone. Right, exactly. If, if you ever if you ever try to get it, you can't. Right, so if anybody ever offers you Buzz Aldrin's Speedmaster, do not buy it, because you're just going to have to forfeit it immediately. The government Literally. agents will come to your home and hunt you down. Uh, and you'll be sad. Th this is actually true. So this has happened to, to people that have claimed to own uh, Apollo, early Apollo Speedmasters. I know a few people that have contacted us where, where this happened. So that really will happen. Uh, so don't take any chances. Don't do it. <laughs> um, one. Additional one from memes. Curious if you have any, have any thoughts on advice for watch enthusiasts who have no experience with auctions. To be honest, the idea of purchasing a watch at auction seems somewhat intimidating, although prices are often reasonable for what's on offer. It seems like an auction house could actually offer many advantages, especially when it comes to ensuring quality and authenticity, and yet buying a watch at auction rarely, if ever, comes up in conversation with my friends. For some, someone who didn't grow up attending these sort of events with family or friends, what's Oh, the screen just went. What's a good strategy, outlook, or entry point that would make contact with an auction house to be a positive experience? I, I will speak from personal experience. Um, I was a collector for many years before making a major career change to join uh, Philips and, and pursue my passion just three years ago. And the way I learned, the best way I learned was going to auction previews. Yeah. And, and it, you really sink your teeth into watches and can learn unlike any other when you go visit auction previews. Yep. And what you do is you read the auction catalogs and you get educated and then you handle the watches. Um, it's an ideal place to learn about all types of watches with no pressure to buy when you, when you go to an exhibition. Yeah. At the same time, when you are an auction house, you are vetting carefully the watches that you offer because you know once you publish a catalog, once you go online, once yeah. you go post it's a picture on scary. Instagram, <laughs> you're going to be vetted by the community. So yeah. the watches that we offer are vetted by the entire watch community. So when you, the ones that end up, we're human, we make mistakes sometimes, and when we make a mistake, we stand behind our product, we pull, we pull an auction if it's not correct, we don't hesitate to do that. Um, but the watches that end up being sold, you can be confident that they've withstood s scrutiny and you'll end up buying a high quality watch. Yeah. What we find in, in our auctions is that you have all types of buyers, whether they're trade, whether they're collectors, mm -hmm. or whether they're people just looking for a great vintage watch, first time buyers. And in every auction, there's always bargains, always. Yeah. And if you do your homework, you come prepared, you're, you know your, your spending limits, it is actually quite a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And you try, and if you win and you're successful, the feeling of, of success is just, it's just great. Yeah. Yeah. So I, was, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say the best place to learn about watches is at auction previews for if sure. you can gain access to them. And they're open to the public totally. for most of them, so you can just go try them on and look at them, and I don't know, it's yeah. cool. I remember the, the early days of Hodinkee being that, that kind of soul, kind of dorky kid with a camera, just like kind of bugging, actually, Cara at some point. Yep. And Paul would come with me occasionally in, in the earlier days and go to Antiquarum mostly back then uh, to just kind of play with stuff. And that, that's where I learned so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Let me just Uh, <laughs> I think that I think we're I think that's it where we are. Okay, I have one question. Then. Okay, Paul. Hmm? Um, yes, Ben. You know what? Actually, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, give me an example of a watch that you remember going for for a bargain in, in auction. Oh gosh, you put me on the spot. Like, what do you think? Mm. Well, maybe not a bargain, but what do you think was a really good buy from a recent Phillips sale? Um. Gosh, <laughs> I'm struggling to remember one that's compelling that I can, I can quickly uh, explain. Um, I have to get back to you on that. Okay, we'll publish an <laughs> we'll answer. Pu on publish that. an answer. Yeah, yeah, let's do a story on but that. But the Hoyer you said is a. This is a potential, is a potential, good example potential of, great bargain. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Cool. How do you think, I have another question. How do you think, so we've been talking in the office a lot about like this will change watches the way the non-watch people view watches? We hope. We I hope. Mean, we hope it opens people's eyes. Yeah. That collecting wristwatches is so exciting and so much fun and is worthy of your consideration uh, for you know, a passion to pursue. Yeah. yeah. All right. And one final message is we want to wish a very happy oh, birthday yeah. to a special man in relation to this watch. Today is Aurel Bach's birthday. He would probably kill us for mentioning that on the air, but happy <laughs> birthday, Aurel. Happy Aral. birthday, Aral. Hope you're having fun out there with the fam. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you soon. And obviously, this watch comes up for sale next Thursday night in New York City. Uh, we'll be broadcast live on Phillips.com, yes. obviously. And uh, yeah, get those, uh, those paddles ready. Yeah. Thank you again, Houdinki. Thank you for coming. Anytime. All right, bye, everybody.